This is Joe Kwan of the Avit Brothers, and you're listening to U.S. Modernist Radio. Mama don't allow no architecture around here. Mama don't allow no architecture around here. Oh, I don't care what mama don't allow, gonna draw my modern anyhow. Mama don't allow no architecture around here. Welcome to U.S. Modernist Radio, where we talk and laugh with people who enjoy, own, create, dream about, preserve, love, and hate modernist architecture, the most exciting and controversial buildings in the world. The profession of architecture, like all professions, is engulfed in its own incomprehensible jargon, yet architects yearn to be better appreciated by the public who are not fluent in what we could call archis speak. For instance, did you know that a window can interrogate sunlight <laughs> and that entrances evoke birthing experiences? Whoa. Or exits, too, I guess. Today, we will talk with writer and broadcaster Tom Dykoff, joining us all the way from London. Support for U.S. Modernist Radio comes from realtor Angela Roll. Stealing the plot from an obscure 1960s Raquel Welch movie. Oh, yeah. Modernist realtor Angela Roll was in Spain studying architecture by day and training with the U.S. parachute team by night. Impressive. She was taken against her will to see a Scottish NATO agent who needed her to find a missing nuclear trigger hidden inside a Chinese figurine. Although freshly kidnapped, Angela said, sure, what the heck? And soon the mysterious Armenian Serapkin follows her every move. For no apparent reason, Angela skydives into the villa of the suavely handsome Peter Merriweather. And they discuss a renovation for his five-star Michelin restaurant and, oh yes, finding that pesky nuclear trigger. After fighting Serapkin once with a knife and another time with a harpoon that will years later kill a large shark, Ooh, Angela da, da, kills da, 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 da. Serapkin and later delivers the trigger to Merriweather, who looks a lot like Tony Franciosa. As the adventure concludes, there's some uh, wink, wink, nudge, nudge, say no more, say no more. Say no more. Today, Angela uses her close combat negotiation skills and architectural training to specialize in modernist houses, advising buyers and sellers on everything from appropriate renovation to choosing the right harpoon, of course. Angela Roll is your special agent. Reach her at AngelaRoll.com. That's R-O-E-H-L or 919-995-0550. And now, here's George Smart. Hi, folks. When Tom Dykoff was young, he obsessed over buildings, bollards, and town planning while his friends were discovering MDMA. I, I know those kinds of experiences. Tom was high on a certain architect we'll talk about and got his thrills from Architectural Review. So this is a guy after my own heart. He is now a really big deal. He is one of Britain's best-known commentators on architecture and urbanism with radio and television and documentary projects to his credit. He was a presenter on the Great Interior Design Challenge and the Radio 4 series The Design Dimension. He's also been the design critic for BBC's The Culture Show and an architecture critic for The Times. He's written for The Guardian. He's been part of a, a series called Saving Britain's Past which examined Britain's obsession with heritage. We'll talk about that. He is an honorary fellow of the Royal Institute of British Architects, which is the British equivalent of RAIA. Welcome, Tom. Hi there. It's nice to be on. Thank you for asking me. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. How are things over there these days? Um, very hot at the moment. We're in the middle of, well, I think, most of the, uh, most of the planet. Um, in the middle of a heat wave, and uh, I think it's uh, pretty much testing uh, British people's patience. We're not we're not used to such hot weather and uh, such a lack of rain. Is everyone running off to Cornwall and trying to escape? Yeah, the school holidays have just uh, started, so uh, yeah, the roads are pretty much uh, chock a block. But um, it's not really a green and pleasant land at the moment. Most of the parks are kind of a, a scratchy, scratchy straw-like uh, color at the moment. Now I understand, Tom, that when you were young. You were a huge fan of Zaha Hadid, is that right? Um, yeah, when I was a teenager, she yeah. was sort of the the person to really sort of look up to, and and I think, as you said in the introduction, I was uh, really interested in in architecture. Though I didn't really quite know why or or what this strange thing was, architecture. I had no role models in my family or friends. Um, you know, we had, there were no architects. 
uh, in our family at all. In fact, nobody interested in sort of the wider area that I'm interested in, which, you know, architecture is just one part of the kind of things that I'm interested in, which I suppose broadly would be, you know, geography, landscapes, cities, urbanism, uh, spaces, um, and and architecture. So Zara Hadid was, you know, somebody didn't know anything about her at all when I was a, when I was a teenager, but her designs are pretty incredible. And, and unlike anything that uh, I had seen in my small hometown of, uh, of Worcester, where we didn't really get to see much of Zara Hadid. I guess she didn't come to Worcester Meyer much. <laughs> Not really, not really. She didn't design the train station or some central public structure. Uh, there wasn't really much contemporary architecture in Worcester. It kind of stopped in the 1960s. Uh, in the 1960s, like many towns and cities in the UK, there was a kind of an attempt to turn this very historic town into a, uh, well, a bit of kind of Los Angeles with a big kind of uh, in a ring road and um, well, it wasn't quite a high-rise concrete tower, but it was uh, it reached to about sort of six stories, which is quite high-rise in Worcester. Well, what what is Worcester's claim to fame, if there's any historical significance that you could enlighten us with? Uh, it's a very, it's, traditionally, it's a very, very beautiful historic cathedral city. So it's a very large uh, cathedral in the center, very, very beautiful. And in common with most kind of cathedral cities in the UK, it's got a very wide selection of architecture. I was probably exposed to it as a kid and maybe, I don't know, maybe had a, a kind of filtered in through my through my eyes and over over the years, you know, it, it, it developed over some medieval times onwards. So there are half timbered Tudor buildings, um, modernist buildings, you know, from the period after the Second World War. There's great Victorian architecture, Regency architecture, Georgian architecture. So it's a very it's a very beautiful city and it sits on the banks of Britain's uh, longest river, the River Severn. Uh, very famous as a centre of the, of the English Civil War in the 17th century as well. It was a big royalist stronghold where um, very famously the king was uh, hidden you know, very close to his defeat, eventual defeat and heading. He was hidden there in uh, in Worcester for quite a quite a long time. But really? yeah, it was a very, you know, it's a, it was a, a kind of archetypical small town UK. Was he perhaps hidden in the Worcester sewage works? Because I'm pulling up Google Earth <laughs> and it has a little marker for that right near the yeah. cathedral. I don't think so. I think he was smuggled in a. <laughs> It was very famously hidden in a in an oak tree at one point. Oh my! Why there's an awful lot of pubs in the UK called the Royal Oak. Um, but I think in in Worcester, I think he might have been hidden in a um, just in someone's sort of back parlour somewhere while he was trying to escape the the parliamentary Republican forces. Well, when you were growing up, did you make pilgrimages to any of Zaha's buildings? Oh uh, no, not that stage. At that stage, Zaha hadn't really built anything at all. I think you know her first building of any substance was uh, the Vitra fire station and I was a teenager in the 1980s so it was mostly the kind of stuff that I would read in in architectural magazines and again I didn't really know what this strange thing architecture was so you know I would sort of creep into the, the local public library and look at the architectural review or um, you know blueprint magazine is a, is a big magazine in the, in the UK and at that time in the 1980s would have been you know, the kind of cutting edge of architectural publications that had all the kind of avant-garde architecture, you know, like the kind of work of, of Zaha Hadid. Because that's where I first saw her. I first saw her work in, in two dimensions, you know, her incredible paintings and drawings that she came up with in the late 1970s into the 1980s. You know, she was very famously an architect that took, you know, quite a long time for a patron um, or a client to kind of entrust with an actual building. So, uh, yeah, it took, it took a while. And where did you go next? Did you go to school to study it, or? No, I didn't. Again, because I had, I had very bad career advice um, when I was when I was about sort of fifteen or sixteen, because uh, I had nobody. I had no understanding of architecture, and there was nobody I could ask. No kind of best friends, dad or mum or anything like that, and nobody in my family. I'd always been I'd always been interested throughout my school days in these two worlds, which one was writing and literature and so on, and I was always really good at English at school. And then the other thing would be, I suppose, geography, history, the humanities and things about spaces and nations and cities and towns and maps and all that kind of stuff. And um, I didn't really, I've always fluctuated, I suppose, in my career between these two worlds. And I suppose the only way I found 
you know, in the last 20 years, I suppose, of my career is to, is to fuse them in some way. So actually, I started out, I went, I got a place at Oxford University to study English literature and studied that for about sort of 16, 18 months and had a kind of uh, crisis at that point where I just thought I'd had, I just did not want to look at another book again and switched to geography and finally graduated in geography and all my English tutors were completely horrified and thought I'd done the most... I don't think anyone had ever switched from English literature to geography in Oxford University history. Um, <laughs> but you knew where the Maldives Islands were. <laughs> well, and I, and exactly, and I knew about, you know, truncated spurs and soil erosion. I think they thought that... I think all my English tutors thought that geography was all about kind of glaciation and soil erosion. But hmm. it's, a wonder, it's an amazing subject in many ways, and it has this uh, ability. It's a bit like um, history. You know, history is the study of everything that ever happened in time, and geography is the study of everything that ever happened in space and in three dimensions. And that's how I kind of treated it. And I managed, I was able to major in urban theory and history um, at, at geography. And I also had an amazing professor who ran the faculty there. We, I didn't know this, of course, when I switched, but he turned out, I found out after. Uh, Studying there, they turned out to be one of the most kind of influential thinkers on the city in, the, I suppose, the last sort of 40, 50 years. A, a fellow called David Harvey, and he was an, an incredible, well, I suppose you could call him an economic geographer. But he kind of theorized how cities changed after deindustrialization, really, how they shifted in focus away from manufacturing to service economies. Yeah. So that was kind of uh, part one, and I did my thesis there on. Um, on architecture, I was allowed to do that, and after that, I, I went and did a postgraduate degree in history and theory of architecture, and I suppose, yeah, the rest is history. Well, where did you begin your career professionally? So after I, I, I studied history and theory at University College London, and then I um, this was the mid nineties, and I just applied. I, you know, I'd done some writing, a little bit of writing before, but I started applying for jobs, and there were two jobs. Advertised. One was for Blueprint, which is that you know wonderful avant-garde architectural magazine. I really wanted that job. Um, the other one was for the Prince of Wales Institute of Architecture, um, their magazine called Perspectives. And the Prince of Wales at that time, in the mid '90s, was still very much the centre of the news about uh, his traditional views on architecture, which you know, didn't really square with mine, to be quite honest. Um, I got I got the latter job. <laughs> <laughs> and they were both owned. What was interesting, they were both owned by the same publishing company. Oh, really? And uh, it was a bit like when you go on a on a aircraft and you turn left, you turn right. And I really wanted to turn left, but unfortunately, I turned right. But having said that, when I got there, it was the most amazing place to work in, principally because I had a a boss there, the editor Charles Worsley. He sadly died in his forties. He was an incredibly promising uh, young architectural historian. And he was just the most amazing, amazing boss you could have, the kind of boss of your dreams. You know, he trained me how to write, how to do the kind of craft of writing, you know, sub-editing and all of that kind of stuff. And he allowed me, he was, he was an incredibly generous um, editor, and he, was, he allowed me the, the thing, the greatest gift you can give, a, you know, a young writer, which is space in a, in a magazine and freedom. And he got, you know, he got me, gave me the opportunity to, at a you know, very young age, in my mid-twenties, to go and interview, you know, people like Phyllis Lambert, you know, um, Seagram Air, who was there, oh, famously yes. suggested Mies van der Rohe for the Seagram thing, and, you know, set up the Canadian Centre for Architecture. I went over to interview her, um, aged sort of 25, a very uh, nerve-wracking thing to do, and I, I got to go and interview Daniel Lieberskind. You know, it was an incredible opportunity. Um, and I think I was able to learn, I suppose, the, the craft of writing, the craft of writing magazine and, and newspaper articles. So it was a wonderful, a wonderful introduction. It might not have been immediately what I wanted. I wanted to go be where the cool kids were, but um, in the end, it, it, it turned out well. Now, the Prince of Wales, Charles, Prince Charles, has historically been very traditional, right? He doesn't like modernist yeah. design at all? He's pretty. Um, yeah, he's pretty antithetical to it. Yeah, he's not a great. He's not a great fan. Very famously, you know, in the particular nineteen eighties, when I was a kid, you know, he was always on the news bulletins, you know, calling this building a carbuncle and that that building like a kind of nuclear power station and uh, so on. So my views, my views, certainly on the style of architecture, um, are in, you know couldn't really be further from 
and that was <laughs> the Prince of Wales. That being said, you know, the, within, you know, buried, there are many thinkers about architecture, but, you know, whether you agree with them or not, buried deep inside some of the Prince of Wales' views are, you know, a certain amount of good sense, you know, that were probably shared among many writers about architecture, certainly when he's talking about the kind of the, the humanity that's required in our in our cities and and in our architecture as well, um, but I think when it comes to style, yes, we probably couldn't we probably couldn't be further apart, really. In the sixties, there was this huge surge of modernist design in the UK as well as in America mm. that was given fairly lukewarm reception at the time. And now people are either rallying to save some of these buildings or are asking them to be torn down. Do you see a lot of that in London? Oh, yeah, very much so. I mean, at the moment, uh, the B word is in- incredibly fashionable in, in the UK, brutalism. It's a, it's a, a publishing phenomenon. That I, I, I've lost count of a number of, uh, of books. And I'm talking, you know, mass market books, you know, kind of coffee table books, uh, on on the aesthetics of brutalism, what what often gets left behind in this great surge of love for the style uh, and approach is the socio economic background and the historical background. We kind of forget an awful lot of this modernist architecture in the post war period was was very very strongly attached to a certain way of seeing the world. You know, connected with in, this, in the UK at least, the, you know, the welfare state and a degree of uh, or a certain idea of democracy. But a lot of that has kind of got, it's got left behind. But in the UK at the moment, I don't know what it's like in, in, in America, an awful lot of this post, of post-war architecture, although our understanding of it and our appreciation of it has grown over the last 20 years, an awful lot of it is still under threat. We had um, the demolition of uh, quite a famous building by uh, the Smithsons over here, you know, a very famous and influential architectural couple, um, Robin Hood Garden, the piece of social housing which is undergoing demolition at the moment, and you know that's the kind of architecture that that's quite easy to sweep away. Certainly, in a, in a situation like London, where uh, the economy is sort of slightly crazy and overheated, and developers hold enormous power, uh, particularly in dealing with kind of local councils and so on, and over their developments. But you know the, the, the way in which post-war modernist architecture is regarded is an absolutely fascinating topic, certainly to me. You know, during the 1960s and 1950s, a lot of this modernist architecture was very warmly received as well, you know, very warmly received, certainly, you know, with regard to slum clearance and the, the, the building of new homes of, you know, incredibly high standard, where it started to get a bit Lukewarm was when those standards and certainly standards of construction started to be corners started to be cut, and then you know during the 1970s, 80s into the 90s, we had a kind of kind of political rewriting of that period. You know, it, it sort of became associated with in inverted commas socialism, even though you know vast amounts of it, if not most of it, was built under conservative governments nationally and, and locally yes, as well. But this coincided with Margaret Thatcher's. Being in office, yeah, very much so. And Margaret, and all that kind of, you know, the, the Thatcherite writing of, of recent history was tied up with the kind of so-called failures of the of the welfare state. And, you know, something that's still going on today. You know, so many, um, so much social housing in the UK is being sold off or part privatised um, simply because of the retraction of the state over the last sort of ten, ten or fifteen years. It's quite a quite a kind of shocking situation, you know, an awful lot of inner city, um, you know, as you would call it, housing projects are, um, are being demolished and replaced by housing where a substantial fraction is given over to social housing, an awful lot of it to what's called affordable rent, a lot of it which is tied to, to market rates as well. So until recently, um, it was tied, you know, tagged to or priced to 80% of, of market rates, which, of course, in a, in a place like London, is, is pretty high. Very high, really yes. Very affordable at all, yeah. So it, it's, a, it's an interesting an interesting time. On the one hand, you've got this kind of appreciation among, you know, the kind of the cool kids of, uh, of brutalism and, and post-war architecture. But on the other hand, it's under threat, and certainly its social purpose um, is in danger of kind of disappearing in collective memory, which is... Uh, which is a horrific thought in my mind. Um, but that said, you know, I, I went in, I mean, literally before I, I came on the on the phone to you, I went into a local store to buy something and uh, a fellow there on the, on the 
cash desk recognized me and said, look, look, what do you think of this building? I said, this is a school I went to. And she said, isn't it ugly? And it was like, you know, a classic 1960s school building, um, <laughs> you know, in all of its glory. I said, look, I, I, really like, I really like it. And he said, oh, it's so ugly. And said, you know, it's a fellow in his 30s. So, well, per- perhaps he know, didn't like school. Yeah, yeah, maybe, maybe, maybe. But I don't know, we think that, you know, modernism... And it is more widely appreciated, certainly more widely appreciated than it was when I was a kid. Um, but, you know, I think there's still quite a long way to go. Um, you know, that being, said, that being said, I think it's an awful lot of people like me in their 40s and in their 30s who are kind of leading this kind of reappreciation of, of post-war modernist architecture. And I think principally because it's set against uh, a kind of, certainly within the UK, a wider kind of societal feeling where the state is being constantly nibbled away at them and kind of shriveling away. And then secondly, it's also, this is kind of our heritage. This is the, the school building that I went to school in, the university buildings I went to university in, the hospital buildings we use. You know, the, the, the post-war welfare state architecture, it's, it's our heritage. And I suppose we're as protective of it as maybe people in the 1970s were of Victorian architecture. Now, you had a great career writing, but then you moved into television documentaries in 2006. You started as a culture show presenter. Was that your first big break into broadcasting? Uh, yeah. Um, I think I, I first appeared as a kind of pundit on a kind of architectural show about a, a prize over here called the Sterling Prize. And that was just after I'd become the architecture critic on The Times. And um, I suppose I was, you know, at that time, relatively young, you know, around 30 or so. So an awful lot of discussion about architecture tends to take place among perhaps an older generation, certainly on, on television. And so, um, for better or worse, I was kind of put up as uh, the voice of youth, even though I wasn't really very young at, at age 30. Um, so I appeared on that, and then I got director of the uh, of the show said, well, look, do you want we do this series for a terrestrial broadcaster over here called Channel 4, called The Art Show, and they, are, and they just they invite people to come and do one-off documentaries. And I did a documentary called I Love Carbuncles, um, exactly <laughs> all about my love of, of post-war concrete architecture. And I really enjoyed it. And I didn't think I would enjoy it at all because I was always the person, when I was younger at school, I was always a shy boy. I was always the person that um, would be very much the last person you would imagine would ever appear on television. And, I, and to this day, I still... You know, I really don't like being the being the centre of attention at all. Um, I'm the kind of person that's very happy, and probably happiest in a library or in a or reading books or in a in a building with a book. Um, <laughs> and yet you but, find but yourself. I kind of enjoyed it. And yet you find yourself with this huge IMDb listing. I mean, you've been on ten different series at least. Well, it's yeah, it, it is slightly yeah, it is slightly strange um, how I've ended up doing that. I mean, there is something quite, you do find an awful lot of relatively shy people um, doing things like performance and television. So I, I imagine there's a certain degree of that. But also, there's also something about, I am just very enthusiastic about learning things and about imparting knowledge, what I've learned. I'm just, innately, I suppose, I love communicating enthusiasm or something incredible or something not incredible, something awful. And I, I suppose ever since I was a little kid, I've always been interested in, in doing that. I've always been interested in, um, you know, going up to someone and saying, look at this incredible building. This is amazing space. <laughs> it all look like tiny little detail. Have you ever seen about that? Or have you seen this little thing? And you know, I, do, I do a lot of teaching at the moment at, at university, and that's it's kind of the same thing. I suppose everything that I've done in my career have all been facets of the same thing, which has been to impart a bit of information and, to, and also as a person to learn themselves as well. Um, and that's what you know. I, I love doing. And when you do television, that's one of the one of the joys of it. I get to learn something, and other people get to learn something too, which sound, makes it sound awfully po faced and uh, smug. But I don't know. There's just something something I really I really love about it. I mean, that, having said that, the last five years, I think, within broadcasting, as everyone knows, you know, it's undergone a, a, a huge revolution with you know the the rise of streaming broadcasters. Um, and I think that's had a, that is in the process of having an incredible impact on broadcasters like the BBC or Channel 4, and I'm sure it's the same in, um, in the US as well. And architecture on television is a very, very, very small part of a very, very small and threatened 
area of you know arts and culture programming and i do fear for its long-term survival to be quite honest i think the one amazing thing you know the, the internet and uh has opened up the world to us, but it's also made us increasingly, I think because of the way search engines work and the way our brains are slowly beginning to wire, it, it's turning us all into niche consumers of media. We end up just finding out more of the same in the same field. And the kind of broadcasting and media and reading that I was always brought up was, was broadcasting, was broad. The, the yes. idea that you might turn on a television set and see a kindly old gentleman in his late 60s telling you something about historic towns in England, and then the next minute it might be David Attenborough right. telling you about natural history. And right. the same in, in newspapers. You know, I would read you know, broadsheet newspapers that my mum and dad would, would read, and there would be an architecture critic next to somebody writing about, I don't know, poetry or contemporary dance, next to somebody yeah. talking about the Iran-Iraq war. You know, there would always be... The, a general interest sort of exactly. publication or, or exactly. TV show, and that maybe is the endangered species. Uh, we just have to learn yeah, that, now how to look for that difficult. stuff. Exactly. Now, now you have to, you know, the way that search engines work, they direct you to more of the same. Yeah. And I think that's really, I think that's really difficult. So I think as a young, you know, now if I was growing up and I, was, and I had nobody around me who knew about architecture and I was interested in architecture, I don't know, would I, would I be exposed to it in the same way? I think I'd have to actively go out and search for it in a way that I, perhaps I wouldn't have had to do before. Um, and I, I do find that a bit worrying. That said, you know, one should always embrace the new and I look forward to seeing what, you know, what the various streaming broadcasters bring to you know, the world of culture and arts. At the moment, I think culture and arts of which, you know, architecture forms, you know, a part, are uh, seen very, very low down their list of, of priorities. One fascinating show you were involved in was Channel 4's Secret Life of Buildings, which talked about psychology oh, and yeah. neuroscience and experiments to examine spaces and the vibe of buildings on people. Tell us about that. Yeah, that was a complete and utter... It's still, I'm still almost proudest of that series, and it's only short series, only three three episodes or so, but I'm, I mean, it, inordinately proud of that, simply because of all the people that we got to work on it. You know, again, it, this learning experience for me, um, as well as hopefully for the for the audience as well. I, you know, I knew nothing about neuroscience. I did biology for a one year in, in secondary school. It's a world that I know nothing about, but as I got older, I'm increasingly interested in. And all we did was really connect these two worlds, the world's of you know, neuroscience and biology and uh, physiology and the world of architecture, contemporary architecture. And what we were interested in, I suppose, was that within architecture, things like environmental determinism, so the way in which your environment determines who you are, were, were, was incredibly fashionable and influential as a kind of philosophy in the 1950s, 1960s and 70s, and then fell out of favor, really, and, and it kind of disappeared or shriveled away. Nonetheless, in the world of neuroscience, it's actually been flourishing in the last you know, 20 years. And the way in which our environment influences our brains and our bodies has become incredibly, incredibly powerful in those areas. So what was fascinating to me was this complete and utter disparity. And, and so I wanted to put the two together to find out how you know, simple things like what does claustrophobia do to you? You know, you're at your body. What does noise do to you? So what we did was we just, we looked at three areas, um, areas of leisure, areas of work, and areas of home, and just looked at um, how, well, what impact that they had on us. Um, and we did it through, you know, live experiments. So, you know, I removed or boarded up the windows in the home in which I live to the minimum standards of, of light levels allowed in the UK and had my kind of blood levels and so on and mood um, tested and gauged over over a fortnight and that sort of showed that my circadian rhythms and the way in which I sleep was radically altered within even within two weeks and uh, there were certainly indicators that my blood was heading towards diabetes or diabetic levels. These sound almost like the sorts of studies they would do on astronauts who are faced with a long space journey or in well, a exactly, submarine. Yeah, exactly. They all come out of the other worlds. And what's yeah. amazing to me as somebody who teaches in architecture school is that none of, well, certainly at that time, none of this stuff was being taught. There is this research in these other areas of medicine um, and physiology that, that is, you know, that's not being taught. 
the most, in fact, the most incredible person we met on this journey was in America, was in San Diego, um, Professor Fred Gage, who was at the Salk Institute in the amazing um, Louis Kahn building. Um, and he had done research on animals to look at what different environments did to those animals and their behavior. And he showed that uh, not only was the brain heavily influenced by the environment, and that you, you were able to gauge things like a stimulating environment um, and what impact that might have on the brain, but that it was not irreversible. But actually, if you grew up or if you spent time in a place which had um, you know, low sensory pleasure or low sensory interaction over a number of years, if you, if you then move those animals into an area which had you know, bright colors or great interaction, amazing toys to play with, but the brain will grow and it will develop. So that was, that was quite a mind-blowing experience for me. And then we went to University of San Diego and started to experiment with um, this amazing place called the Cave, which kind of simulates different environments. So yeah, that would sort of be the extreme. There's wires. And I had all of the wires attached to my head so you could see what would happen to my brain and my receptors as, you know, as light went down or as the walls closed in. It was quite, it was, it was honestly, for me, it was such a revelation. I'd love to have done, uh, I'd love to have done more and to have written about it. Unfortunately, I'm, science was never one of my strong suits at school. So uh, <laughs> maybe, I'll, maybe I'll return to it later on. But I know it's an area that's sort of growing and growing. And I think there's a lot of interest, certainly in the UK, there's been increasing interest, I think, in the effects that spaces have over us, certainly you know, with regard to health and so on. So you never know. It's potentially an area that will, that will kind of grow and grow and grow. And it was picked up by Netflix, which is great. So it's, it's had oh. a good distribution around the world. Um, and, and what's the name of the it, series again? Uh, the Secret Life of Buildings. Okay. Tom, let's talk about architects. I know a lot of them. I'm sure <laughs> you do too. <laughs> In fact, I know yes. probably more than I should. And they're all great. They're all very smart. They're talented. They're creative. And almost all of them are disappointed that the public doesn't warm to them and the profession of architecture as they wish they did. And you made some little ripples in the Twitter universe last June with a little Twitter skirmish about the way architects speak about their work. Tell us about that. Mm. Yes, I think I, I, <laughs> I never I never tweet when you're drunk, and never <laughs> never tweet when you just um, f- finish marking a load of student essays. I think it's a, <laughs> it's a message, um, a lesson for that. That's noted. Then. It came out of frustration of having having been marking an awful lot of um, essays, and uh, you know I I didn't train as an architect. I did a, I did architectural history, but I'd never trained as an architect. So the, the world of architecture school is still. A bit of a mystery to me, even though I, I teach in them. I got taught in, you know, the liberal arts, humanities, and that's a world I know. The way in which architects are trained seem, I don't know, it's like in the US, but in the UK, it's its quite a peculiar system. You know, we have this unit system on the whole, which is very competitive, um, which gets, you know, architects together in sort of gangs throughout their kind of three to um, seven years of training. Um, and... The design side of it is heavily accented, so most of their time is spent on on designing stuff, learning how to design and to design and to design. And the bit that I teach, I suppose, which is history and theory, um, how one writes and talks about architecture, is you know you, you don't get an awful lot of the students' time, and, and I think very much the students very can often think of it as being a bit like taking a medicine, um, and you know perhaps. Perhaps we're teaching it in the wrong way. I don't know. But one thing that does happen in architecture school, I think, is certain cultures of learning about architecture and what buildings are start to be inculcated in in students. And there's something about the traditional architecture school, its competitiveness, its kind of hothouse atmosphere, um, that kind of starts to yank the student away from being... Just a normal human being. That sounds that sounds rather damning in many ways, but it creates it, it almost kind of sets the architect apart from the rest of society somehow. There's something about the language that they're taught to use and something about the culture of how the hard you know, the long hours, the kind of the competitive atmosphere that sort of starts to start to change 
um, these students from a from a young age, and it, it's it's very it's really peculiar. I, I'm very fascinated by the way in which architects and architecture are regarded by the rest of society in all of its variety. And you know, there has been for a long time this you know this cultural stereotype, shall we call it, of of the architect as you know generally male, um, you know, egocentric, the kind of Howard Rourke dress in black. Yeah, yeah, and you know, obviously, like most stereotypes, you know, they they come from a, a well of truth. You know, yeah. and even you know, right up to this day, if you if you were to speak to or just pull somebody off the sidewalk and say, "What do you think an architect is?" I would almost guarantee that they will come up with a fairly standard idea about what an architect is, and I think that's very bad for society, very bad for the profession. And, uh, you know, I think it's, it's something, I suppose, after having marked all those student essays with uh, kind of uh, slightly kind of jargonistic language that, yeah, started to annoy me. And uh, anyway, you never treat when you're, when you're annoyed. But um, does, doesn't every professional field have its own jargon? It's sort of like a secret oh, code? Of course. Yeah, of course. And, and, you know, I'm in the course, club, you're I, in the club. I have no problem. Architects tend to use it all the time, <laughs> whereas... Most professions, like doctors, when they talk to each other, they're talking in medical terminology. But when they're talking to their patients... That is the problem. Yeah, I think that, that is the problem. And I think that sometimes long words are used as a way of demonstrating one's uh, intelligence. It becomes a kind of uh, a kind of show-off kind of thing. And the difference, I think, with... But I think the most successful architects have always been the ones that are able not only to create an incredible building and to do all the astonishing things that architects have to do, but also are really good communicators as well. And are, and are good communicators to ordinary people, by which I mean anyone that's not an architect. And the kind of writing about architecture that I really love can be arcane, it can be artistic, but really the best thing is, is clarity. It's something that, you know, your mum, your sister, the person down the market or the supermarket could understand. And I think that's a different, you know, architecture is by very definition a social art. It's about creating spaces for us all to live in. Um, and even from a very, very mercenary perspective, an architect has to deal with a client, has to deal with a patron. And a client and a patron will almost certainly not be able to understand jargon and almost certainly won't be able to understand plans and cross sections and so on. And the, the best way of communicating architecture is through words. And so what can architects well. do, Tom, to improve this, particularly in dealing with the public? It's tricky. It's really tricky because some of the students that I teach at university, you know, they've, they've very often given up humanities or liberal arts, you know, when they're 15 or 16. Um, it may very well have you know gone into into science, you know, studying maths or um, chemistry or, or whatever at, at, at A level, at, you know, between sixteen and eighteen, um, and then they get you know thrown into architecture school because architecture is something that is almost always not taught at um, at school level, so their exposure to it might, might not be um, they might not have necessarily developed the language for it at school in the way that you have you know, even maths and chemistry and other subjects you might study at university. So it's really difficult. And if you've got a really good person or a re really good teacher at university who's able to, you know, to break down and to really force you to look at a building and, and talk about it and describe it and think about adjectives and putting together sentence and so on, it's really difficult to, to intervene in many ways. And, and actually, you know, at architecture school, Students don't often get that much or that many chances to, to write about architecture because so much of their time is spent, you know, designing and also speaking to other architects and other trainee architects. What what should they do? They should read they should read, you know, good writing and, and what's good television programs and go and see films about architecture. You know, expose themselves as much as possible to to writing. And by that I mean I don't just mean architecture critics and architecture historians, I mean, writers, you know, great writers. You know, Charles Dickens is you know, a great writer on architecture. You know, the descriptions that he might use in, in his novels of, of buildings, of cities and spaces. Uh, Thomas Hardy, a great British novelist, but also trained as an architect as well. 
you know, open your eyes and your ears to, to language. I must say, in, in looking at clips of your shows on YouTube, you do quite well in explaining things and concepts in a very easy-to-understand method. Well, I hope so. I hope so. I mean, I hope... Um, that's, that's very kind. I mean, I hope I... I always have in the back of my mind, how would I explain this to my sister? <laughs> or how would I explain this to my wife? You know, how would I... What, would, what words would I use? How would you... Put, boil it down, you know. But also, you hope that you're able to write in a way that's enjoyable as well and also has some kind of... You know, critical edge as well. You know, you want to be able to, um, to I suppose, tick all those boxes. You know, to be intelligible, but also to be um, critical, but also to be enjoyable as well. And you know, it's a it's a, a lifetime learning experience for me. You know, I, I I learn from the people that I read and from the people that have taught me, uh, particularly within architectural history. My professor that you know carries on influencing me as a uh, astonishing fellow called Adrian Forty, and he taught me at, uh, at University of Architectural History. And he wrote a great book for Words and Buildings about 20 years ago, and it's uh, it's one of the very few analyses in the English language of the way in which we talk about architecture, in particular the way in which architects talk about architecture. He focuses very much on modernist architecture, and I suppose the simple message from it is that the, the words that we choose in order to describe something are not only you know, socially and culturally t- determined by, the, by their age and the environment that they're produced in, but can go on to then form the architecture that we all live in. We, we build sentences out of words, but also you know, we can build buildings out of, out of words as well. Tom, I have one last question. Has there been any unanticipated... Sure fun experiences that have come out of your TV appearances? For example, have you been invited on Graham Norton or to drive the test track on Top Gear? No. <laughs> <laughs> not, not yet. Not yet. I, I, I have yet to experience that. Maybe, you know, fingers crossed. Um, fingers crossed. Because uh, I think you would be come. great think... on Top Gear, taking the car around for a spin. <laughs> <laughs> you haven't seen me driving. <laughs> I go about sort of five miles an hour. I'm not, I'm not exactly speedy. Because you're busy um, looking at all the buildings. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's true. Um, no, no, yeah. But the, the, the interesting things are, you know, when you get to do things like, you know, meet incredible people, it's an enormous privilege, you know, to get to meet, you know, the world's great architects, to go and meet, you know, experts in their field. Uh, that is a great privilege. And I suppose, the mo- I suppose one of the most kind of slightly awkward but nonetheless satisfying moments was interviewing Norman Foster in, in his skyscraper over here called the Gherkin in, in London. He kind of thought that we'd ambushed him, but we got him together. We, we, we told his office this was going to happen. Anyway, we got him together with some of the users of the building um, who expressed some not entirely <laughs> complimentary views about um, their workspaces with him. Um, and there's nothing like an architect squirming on TV <laughs> when faced with the use of their building well, to make good television. What's he supposed to do about it now anyway, you know? What, you go back yeah, and tear it down and redo it? <laughs> it's, it's too late now. It's too yeah. late now. Um, but the point of that was that you know, he designed some, some incredible office building early on in his career and uh, where he was able to... Uh, it wasn't really a pop at, um, at Norman Foster, really, but rather the culture of speculative office development in, in the UK. But I don't know, those kind of moments are are interesting because, you know, getting the architect face to face with with the user doesn't often happen really. And I was trying to think, often. have they ever actually put any architects on Top Gear? Have they sent Norman Foster around the track? I don't think so. Arch- again, architects are one of these things that fame and architecture it kind of exists among the jet set, you know, that fame, you know, famous people that are interested in architecture, but also, you know, you know, your Kanye West and so on, who'll, who'll know about architects and architecture. Brad Pitt, and, yes. You know, uh-huh. People like you and me. But actually, you know, the person on the street, do they really know architects? They might possibly, they might possibly know Frank Lloyd Wright, perhaps, or maybe Charles Ring Macintosh, or I don't know, maybe, maybe Le Corbusier, perhaps, if, they're, if they've read a few books, I don't know, on the subject, but but you can you can dream, can't famous, you? I think. Yeah, <laughs> they're not quite as famous as, as architects think they are. I think is, uh, is the message. 
Tom, thank you so much for being with us. We're thrilled at getting a chance to talk with you because you're obviously a very exceptional authority on all this. Oh, it's a great pleasure. Well, thanks for inviting me. It's been, uh, you know, I, 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 nothing I like better than what you're going about architecture. So you're very kind to invite me on. Well, it's our pleasure to have you. Thanks for listening. U.S. Modernist Radio is underwritten by... Angela Roll, you're a special agent for Modernist Houses. 919-995-0550. Okay, take us out, Tom. Visit usmodernist.org to listen to past shows and discover 7,000 mid-century modernist houses, plus millions of pages of architecture magazines, all free to access. U.S. Modernist Radio is produced by Soundtracks, recording studios in Raleigh, North Carolina. Our theme song was performed by George Smart and Robinson Earl. Cindy Stratton, not her real name, researches agents from a secret location near Starbucks. U.S. Modernist Radio is a production of Triangle Modernist Archive, a nonprofit educational organization for the documentation, preservation, and promotion of modernist residential design. George and I will be back in two weeks with another materially spatial, praxis-aligned, negative, concrete, void, spatula-inspired ins- spatula edition? Yes, spatula. Just flip it up. Oh, yeah. okay. Of U.S. Modernist Radio. Modernist Radio.